white people. We're the fucking worst. <laughs> to do this man like i you know like ever since it was like okay we're gonna do this i'm like i can't fucking wait to talk not just about this movie but like what what i got out of it and what it means to me and and just do some politics catch up that's that's one of my favorite things to do uh on this show is i don't normally like i'm not completely up front all the time with my politics but on this show i'm like fucking let that liberal flag fly baby this is the place this is this is the soapbox. Yeah, yeah, and uh, and I got shit to say. <laughs> Good, because I like to listen. Great. We may have already started the episode. Holy shit! Before you know it, you know you're you're drinking after work, working at the car rental place in Mississippi, or you're oh, in man. Staten Island, New York. Yeah. And uh, you just you wake up on a plane, maybe, or. You wake up in the middle of the next episode of the Psycho Semantic Podcast. I am Darren. Hopefully you know that already. With me, once again, returning champion, Bo Ransel. <laughs> Thanks, man. Uh, I'm Yeah, I, again, I'm excited to be here. When I woke up on the plane, I thought, well, this is fucked up. And, and then I got a free shoe. So um, all it cost me was an eye. Yeah, I, <laughs> you know, it look. Maybe it's worth saying this right up front is I didn't see this movie in theaters, the the movie we will eventually talk about this evening. And and the reason I didn't is because the rumor around it, the, the buzz on the street was that it was a, a really toothless sort of political horror film. And and so I didn't watch. It. I was like, well, if the movie doesn't have a stance, I don't give a shit. Like I, I, the the one thing I don't want out of a political f- horror film is no opinion at all. You know, like I'm not in the mood for an equal opportunity offender kind of thing. I and, would, yeah. And, and but then when I saw the movie, I was like, oh, that's not what this is. That like, in I mean, kind of, sort of, but not really. Like the the ultimate philosophy of the film is not just. Will you take a look at these idiots? I mean, it, there's a, there's some of that, but I think there's a deeper thing happening in the in the movie as well. Um, and you know, just to tip our hats here, uh, or mine in particular, the fact that Betty Gilpin is fucking amazing in this movie um, makes it eminently watchable. I, like I've watched the movie twice in at least as many months now. And and both times I watched it, I was like, God damn, she is good. I like Glow. That she's in Glow, right? I'm not mi- mixing her up. She like I went through her her filmography, and she was in stuff I'd always heard was good and never watched, like Glow, um, Masters of Sex. She was in, and I never watched that. Uh, a couple of other things that were that I was like. I have just like missed her like a ship passing in the night uh, so many times. And so this is the first and literally only thing I've ever seen her in. You may enjoy at least her character in glow. I'm not a big wrestling guy. I kind of stopped watching. I don't even know if you're going to get this reference, but somebody listening will get it. I kind of stopped watching around the time that, jake the snake roberts was having his poisonous king cobra bite randy savage (laughs) i that vaguely rings a bell i know all those names that's around when i just kind of started fading away from the stuff but i was very interested in glow when i was younger partly because i like to learn things 
and partly it was because wrestling girls can you know be attractive sure uh, yeah know? i mean foxy boxing has been a thing throughout history yeah there <laughs> it's not like you don't have to d- dig hard to do the math on that and there were some badasses and that's one of the things that i do like about the show is it's not just here's a bunch of pretty girls you know everybody like that but betty uh, gilpin is that how you pronounce her last name i haven't I, really said it outside i out loud think that much. so uh, that's how I've been saying it, and she is yet to correct me. <laughs> she is welcome to. She is welcome to call you. You would give out your... your yeah, I absolutely... Life. She can call me and be like, you know, you fucked up, bitch! Yeah. And then <laughs> pronounces it correctly. Uh, that would be great. There's a boot behind every bitch that she says. Oh my god. It's, it's, anyway. Yes. It's, it's we'll like... It. No, I get it. I don't know. There's just like a power in using a word that's used against you so often that i think uh crystal or betty gilpin really taps into in this uh i think her character is so like fleshed out it it's ridiculous how much characterization is even though you know almost nothing about her you kind of know everything you know like the uh, the the movie was written by Damon Lindelof and another guy whose name escapes me right now but it was a guy who who wrote for um the leftovers and uh some other stuff some other Lindelof pro- projects as well but um, it's it, like, I think it is a, in addition to being an incredibly fun script. And I think first and foremost, I think this movie is out for you to have a good time watching it. Yeah. And, and, and it, the fact that it does that, but also brings you this great character at the center of it. And then happens to have a, a message that, I like because I agree with uh, at the end of the day, um, you know, it, it, in a weird way, seeing it for the first time, it, I felt bad. I hadn't seen it yet. And since then I've become a total evangelist for this movie where I'm like, y- y- what you haven't seen the hunt. What the fuck is wrong with you need to see the hunt. And, uh, and, and so I've, I've really turned a corner on it, but yeah, I, I think you're right. I think there is, there is, excellent character work in this film and it and it surprises me how good it is sorry everybody if you did not read the episode description or title we and or listen to what Bo was just saying i think you said the name of the movie five times probably we are officially talking about the hunt like you said it came out god it came out i think march 13th yeah right before the shit went down yeah Right before the shit went down, there was the controversy around it forever. Similarly, I thought it was going to end up being some... And I'm an easy sell for a political horror movie. I've seen President Evil twice. <laughs> right, well, you know, the first time it's just to experience and uh, it. And the second time is to get the nuance. Yeah, you got to get all those Easter eggs. And... Yeah, I I mean there the uh, the White House was strongly against this movie coming out. Sean Hannity shat his pants in protest because it was going to glorify radical leftist liberals killing right. cool red hat people or whatever. Yeah. However however they were framing it. I can only listen to so much before I start to just hear the white noise yeah man I, you know there's a slight sidetrack as will happen often i'm sure in this episode but um for similar reasons i was kind of like i like to watch both political conventions uh generally speaking because i think it is interesting to see how each party positions its candidates and what the platform is and that kind of thing um, this is one of the the few years that I'm just like, I can't watch the RNC this year. I cannot, if it is going to be five nights of Trump speechifying, I just can't do it. Like I can watch somebody giving a speech about Trump, but it is very difficult for me to watch a speech given by Trump. I didn't 
necessarily set this up on purpose to be recording so we had an excuse to be missing the rnc <laughs> right it, it's a great reason not to watch it though as if i needed more than you know what the the content of the the convention is um <laughs> well i was told the, the 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 republican party did it or the spokesperson for the republican party i should say said that it's not going to be all doom and gloom and negativity and hostility that we apparently got at the DNC. Yeah, which I have to say was not my takeaway from the DNC. I thought it was it was really uplifting and there were at least three times I shed tears. <laughs> and the rest of the time it was kind of overly wholesome for myself I, I was very surprised to see it described as dark and doubt you know there was like i'm proud to be part of the electoral process and and all this other stuff i, I don't want to say overly wholesome but man that roll call uh at the dnc was one of the like most patriotic things i've seen in years and it like i i felt so genuinely uh warmed and and like is somewhat humbled by the scope of america that you see in that and the and the the just uh, the the diversity and i don't just mean like well there were they had colored people i mean like the diversity of landscape and weather and like everything from that kind of blue gray sea of, of, of uh, the East coast to Hawaii and, and, and everything in between. And it really was meaningful to me when I watched it. I thought it like, I've never really cared about the roll call at the, at the either convention. And that was the first time that I was just like, Oh my God, this really feels like it is trying to be representative of what this country is um and and like i said not just in in um you know sort of a demographics kind of way but just like look at how big this fucking country is and look at all the the different geographies and and it, I, I don't know i thought it was really wonderful i thought uh that was really nice but yeah i don't know i suppose that given biden's speech about uh, him being, you know, a warrior of the light and, and that we've been living in dark times. I suppose you could infer that that's a sort of a doom and gloom message, but also, you know, we're living in a country that has, has fallen behind the rest of the world entirely in its response to a pandemic. And, and as such has caused, you know, incredible economic harm, incredible, uh, uh, like a, a public health crisis that it would, you know, I mean, like there's only so much you can do with a pandemic, but you know, you do something, something, and, yeah. something right. That's not uh, worsening things. Even. Yeah. And or you know, total, they, I don't know. I don't, I, I wonder if complete neglect would have been better. I, I mean, probably not. Right. I mean, because at that point, like it, it wasn't a total shrug. It was just th this reluctance to treat it with any seriousness. And then, of course, a complete and abject failure to use the time that we bought ourselves in the quarantine to do anything like a responsible, you know, medical and federal response. But. You know, as dark as the times are, I, I never got the impression that the DNC was just hammering home. Like it, like it never felt like you guys, you can't go outside anymore. You know, unless you vote for Joe Biden, you're gonna be feasting on the flesh of your young. Um, I, like that was never the thing. Even when you had some, you know, pretty heavy hitters like uh, Michelle and Barack Obama being incredibly critical of the president in a way that I, I don't think they've ever been publicly before, although they have been critical of him publicly, just maybe not so pointedly. Um, you know, even that stuff I felt like ended with uh, this message of hope 
that like hey you know this is for real we're we're living in dangerous times and and you as a citizen have a responsibility but if you do that there is there is light at the end of the tunnel and you know i guess that's what they're they're the, the rnc is implying there um i don't know that just saying none of that is happening is the right message and maybe that's not the message he's given i mean again we're not watching it but if if it's anything like what trump has been saying of late it's just going to be like oh no everything's getting better everything's fine i figured it was either going to be like that you know a big long rambly speech about securing the airports and the revolutionary war and the 1918 flu ending world war ii or whatever the fuck he said a couple weeks ago <laughs> yeah uh or it'll be just a giant 1984-ish video screen of footage from the last four years you know wildfires and floods and people puerto rico and cops beating people in the streets and gassing them and then it'll just say make america great again or keep america great or no one would be safe in Joe Biden's America. Yeah, well, they've already trotted that one out, right? Where they, they've said, like, hey, look at what's happened in Chicago and Portland and places like that. And th it's going to spread to the rest of the country yeah. if, if you don't elect me, Donald J. Trump, as as your president again. And, you know, like Pence was quoted today as saying, uh, you know, the, the campaign is essentially make America great again, again. <laughs> <laughs> which is a quote that came out of that man's mouth you know but uh yeah i i mean that that seems to be the republican justification for another four years um i i four don't know how it's gonna play libs. yeah it and it, it is it is more of the divisive politics that that trump wields best you know that is his one political tool and he's very good at it uh, you know, I want to give credit where credit's due. Like, Trump is great at drumming up his base into this, you know, foaming mouth frenzy at times. And it's unfortunate that that plays, but also at a time when when you are dealing with a pandemic and when you are dealing with historic job loss um, and and we are retracting from the world in a way that, makes the world a scarier place, you know, like the less, the less involved we are with the doings of the world, the, the scarier it's going to seem because we don't have any control over it. And so there's always going to be a segment of the population that's going to respond to an authoritarian figurehead as, in that way, like a, as a, a, a safety net of some kind in a, world that is this tumultuous that's unfortunate but i think it you know psychologically it's understandable and trump just is a savant with being able to prey upon that particular like reptilian brained sort of thing you know it's it's the amped up version of bush at ground zero saying you know soon they'll hear you too and and saying like i you know what he said in in 16 which was i'm the only one who can fix this i'm the one who can drain the swamp i'm the one who can bring your jobs back um you know m making that case i mean having delivered on none of it of course but but he's gonna say it again and and the question is are people going to go with him a second time uh you know some for sure will but there are also some that voted for Trump because he said things like, you know, I'm going to bring manufacturing back to the Midwest. Well, when that didn't happen, do they stick with it? That That's the thing that interests me about this election is, are, are people going to change their minds about Trump? That, like, we gave him a shot, he seemed like an asshole, but we were willing to forgive that because he was going to bring back manufacturing. And then when he didn't do that, is he just then an asshole who let you down or do you give him another shot at it? 
you know, from a purely political point of view, that's, that's the part of it that, that kind of interests me as a political junkie, <laughs> you know, as someone who looks at it purely as a sociological experiment, um, as a human being, the thought scares the shit out of me, but as someone who has been interested in politics since Reagan, uh, the seeing seeing this warped version of Reagan play to a modern audience is really interesting to me. The one thing you can say about Reagan is he did a lot of terrible shit, and his policies were fucking terrible, and 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 you know resulted in homelessness like we'd never seen, and you know et cetera et cetera. A number of reasons that you can complain about about Reagan's policies, but. Reagan always pretended to be the everyman president and, and wanted everyone to love him. And that's the differentiator. I mean, in addition to the fact that like, you know, Reagan was a governor and, and had some idea of how, how politics worked and operated. And Reagan wasn't in the business of upending the table and destroying norms and that kind of thing. But he like Trump has all the cult of personality of Reagan without any of the actual like political know-how or uh, the ability to, to use the levers of power, you know, uh, Trump's just like, well, I don't understand the rules of the game. So fuck this game. Here's a new one. And, and that's what he's been playing for four years where he ignores, you know, things like the law and constitution and, and shit like that. Um, because he doesn't give a shit. Like that's not, he, he, he is in it purely for the, the personality game. Not, not, he has no political agenda. He just wants the power and to be loved. Yeah. And what to spend 400 years of a presidential salary at his golf clubs. Yeah. I mean, yes, he's lining his pockets. You gotta bust the joint out before you burn it. (laughs) Man, you know, that's, holy shit, man. I mean, the thing that I'm most interested to see is once he leaves office, the the books that are going to come out and the like what I want is that eight part Netflix series that's like, here's all the fucked up shit that was happening that nobody paid attention to because there were so many other fucked up things happening. And I think so much of it is going to be that kind of thing, all the financial stuff, the you know, diverting the planes in Scotland and and uh, all the people buying $150,000 a night rooms at his properties to get it some time with the president or, or whatever. And there's the argument that, well, it's both sides that, you know, politics just by nature is corrupt. And I agree with that too, to some extent, but, you know, there there's never been a politician short of maybe Spiro Agnew, maybe, uh, who has been as brazenly, uh, uh, like opportunistic, you know, like Spiro Agnew was, was taking money in the vice president's office, uh, from, (laughs) from other people, you know, for political favor. So I'm, I'm, I, I wonder if Trump has been that bold and I would be surprised if he hadn't been. If it didn't affect everyone everywhere, it would be purely fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if the stakes weren't so high, like I would love to watch this movie without it actually affecting people, you know, like today, uh, was it today where he said that they're not accepting new DACA applications, even though the Supreme court ruled, that you know stopping the program was was uh outside the bounds of trump's authority he he probably said that again he said it a week or two ago yeah and you know it's one of those things of just like you know there there has never been a leader in my lifetime that's like what did the supreme court say eh, so what about that they don't like me right right like it, just because they're a republican majority and i put a couple of them on there um they they just don't like me for whatever reason um compared to the deep state yeah holy shit that deep state shit like that's you know i mean this gets back to the hunt though and and you know maybe we should say what the movie is actually about um but it it is about like hillary swank and her buddies have a text chain 
and the text chain is them joking about having a manor uh, in Vermont where they're going to hunt a dozen deplorables is, is how they're referred to. Um, what is it? The, the rat fucking chief. Like, did you see what the rat fucking oh, chief did today? The rat fucker in chief. Yeah. Day ruined. Yeah, right. <laughs> Day equals ruined. Um, yeah. And it, it's a, it's a text chain that, that pretty much anyone on the left has had with their friends at one point or another. And maybe not even just on the left, but, uh, you know, it's certainly like the day after Trump got elected, I was so depressed. Uh, I, I was so angry and and lost so much faith in, in just people in general. And, and my my attitude about it was, you know, how can these fucking morons, you know, elect it? How could they fall for this? How could they fall for uh, someone who is so clearly a shyster? And and I was. Uh, like I said, I was real down about it, and 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 it really it broke my heart in a lot of ways. Uh, just, it, it revealed the country to be some something other than what I thought it was, uh, or so I thought. And and now I I I think that less so. And now uh, there there, when I think about it now, there are reasons that make a lot of sense why he was elected. But, um. It, it really, it stunned me and it, and it, and it hurt and all that. And, and so I was one of those people that was, uh, really kind of militant about how I, I just really hated people who voted for Trump. I hated it. I, I, I felt like they had just betrayed the country. And, uh, and so anyway, you take that attitude and you drop it into this text chain with a, some very wealthy people in in the film the hunt um and so we see this text thing happen and then we move to a an airplane where uh dennis from <laughs> it's always sunny in philadelphia is being real smarmy as he normally is with a flight attendant is that the 1907 heidsick yeah uh no it's just champagne oh um I I also like uh, when he's like, so, well, do you have anything that's, I don't know, maybe like a grilled vegetable, like a sort of a Mediterranean thing? <laughs> and when she when the stewardess is like, you know, uh, we don't have a full kitchen here. We just we just have what we have. <laughs> he's like, ah, well, shit. <laughs> um, I you know, that that kind of privilege is is, is what the, the movie is presenting us with. And then, as uh, as this is happening, out stumbles the this rather heavy set dude uh, named Randy, and Randy has just woken up in the back of the plane, and they realize like, oh shit, this guy woke up before uh, he was supposed to, and so uh, one of the dudes just stabs the guy in the neck with a ballpoint pen. And then out comes Hillary Swank. Although you don't see Hillary Swank's face until what the third act of the film, yeah. uh, even and you hear her a bunch, but you you don't see her. Um, and she comes out and just stabs the guy in the in the face with her very high heeled shoe, uh, putting him down. It's a real like whoa fuck and like there's a real good gory eyeball stuck to the spike of the heel kind of thing where it's like oh shit this movie's gonna get rowdy. And, and I, I knew from there, I was like, okay, this might be something. And then we cut from that to sort of the thrust of the film, which is it's a bunch of people kidnapped and brought to somewhere mysterious, uh, with gags locked onto them and they are going to be hunted. Uh, the the titular hunt. It is a bunch of left wing uh, liberals who have a lot of money and have gotten fed up, and they are uh, they are hunting a bunch of right wing uh, folks who have posted shit on various social media. One guy has a podcast called like the Confederate Files or something. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, the Ethan Supley character. Yeah. The crisis babies. <laughs> right. 
and and so that's the 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 setup right is that you have uh these highfalutin liberals with all their money have kidnapped all these right-wing folks and are and set about to murder them uh what they fuck up in the process though is that they have brought betty gilpin um crystal may uh to to this location and she is fucking murder on two legs and so there's also here's a a thing that i like that the movie does i like the emma roberts head fake where you know, like you kind of start on when you get when you first get to the i almost call it an island because it's kind of the most dangerous game in a lot of ways but you uh you begin with emma roberts who wakes up in the woods finds out that she's gagged sees betty gilpin for a second who picks the lock on her padlock holding the gag on uses the same uh needle that she's taken from a name pin um to figure out where north is thanks to a leaf in the water and then she fucks off (laughs) and uh and leaving behind emma roberts who then goes to this clearing where uh there's a big wooden crate uh which when you open it up and a bunch of the other people have gathered uh in this clearing uh, that have been kidnapped and they open up this crate and inside is, are, it's a bunch of weapons, guns and knives and shit like that. Uh, as well as a, a key to the gags uh, taped to the door. And so everybody kind of frees themselves of the gags and they start to arm up and then fucking mayhem ensues as they, they are shot. One lady falls in a punji pit uh, in a really effective moment there are landmines and grenades, all kinds of crazy shit. And it is wonderful and gory. And I love everything about this scene. And also Emma Roberts, uh, who we started with, gets her head fucking shot off by a 50 cal in, uh, what, about the first 10 minutes of the movie? Uh, I'd say that's about 10 minutes because I um, Squealer on the gets it on the plane about five, six minutes in. Yeah, I mean, this movie doesn't fuck around. Like, you get to murder and mayhem right away. And, um, yeah, and it's a, like, it's a great gory scene. M- my favorite moment of the whole thing, I think, is when um, the the kind of heroic dude uh, who helps the girl who falls in the pit of spikes out when he's like, all right, I'm going to get you to safety. And then he steps on that landmine and just looks up like, oh, fuck. (laughs) And when it explodes, you see the girl's legs go flying from the, like, from the, like, waist down so that the legs are connected. It's just half her body just, like, cartwheeling away during this explosion. And when you next see her, uh, Ike Barinholtz is, is the dude who finds her. And she is back in the punji pit, re like stabbed by these spikes. Only now she's missing the lower half and it's just intestines down there. <laughs> it's pretty fucking good, Darren. I'm not gonna lie to you. I feel like this movie delivers. I saw this. I paid twenty dollars to rent this as soon as I could. Uh huh. I, I I was fine with it. I said okay. And you know what? I, I, I haven't done that with too many of the movies that have come out this year but i i wanted to throw some money this way a, a lot a lot of the ways a lot of people say you know throw money into the into the horror genre you know i did a little bit of that i, I forget i don't think the wet the the google i don't think google calls this a horror movie but i mean how could it not be it, yeah i mean i guess you could you could park it under the thriller label yeah, or something satire but, thriller drama yeah but it's awfully gory like this feels like a horror comedy day and and almost more comedy than horror i double featured this once with ready or not that's a great yes that is a fine pairing so yeah we, we we've got betty gilpin the people are scattering everybody's a caricature yeah, like Ike Barinholtz is a real Second Amendment guy. Like as as they run away from the initial killing field, it's him, 
a lady who I like to think is a closeted lesbian. When you see her later, she's uh, holding a sign that says don't be gay, but she has the most lesbian mullet I've ever seen. I think she's called Big Red in the in the credits. Yeah. And uh, anyway, so it's it's her. It's Ike Barinholtz. It's another dude. One guy. <laughs> there's a really nice moment here where one guy is trying to climb the fence. So he starts getting shot up by arrows. And he just goes, fuck it, and turns around with his revolver and just starts shooting in the direction of where the arrows came from. And he gets taken down, like, two or three arrows later, he finally collapses. And then, as he's lying on the ground, a grenade rolls over to him, and he kind of winces, like, okay, this is it. Only it doesn't go. And then you hear off-screen somebody say, did you pull the pin? Oh no. And then another grenade bounces over to the first one, only this one without the pen and it blows up. It's a very funny bit. Um, I mean, it's darkly funny for sure, but it's very funny. Um, and, and so like the, the three survivors of this killing field, cause the movie does a nice job of making you forget like, Oh, Betty Gilpin, you saw her for a two seconds early on. And then she kind of disappears from the movie for a little while. And, so our three, you know, survivors of uh, of the initial uh, murders make their way to a convenience store run by Amy Madigan and an old man. <laughs> and I look, it does my heart good anytime I see Amy Madigan because I flash back to how good she is in Field of Dreams. But they are um, a super liberal couple who of. Uh, like uh big red gets poisoned by some donuts um they throw uh some kind of poison gas grenade that takes down the other dude and then they shoot ike Barinholtz with a sawed off shotgun and then start cleaning it all up and then they have this whole conversation about like when you can use the word blacks and um how how terrible <laughs> they are they say it on NPR, which is made up mostly of. Yeah, when the guy goes, white people, we're the worst. It's, man, I got such a good laugh out of that. That is such a great, like, jab at just self-hating liberals. <laughs> I loved it. Oh, I loved it so much. And, and then finally, into the movie proper comes Betty Gilpin, not just dropping needles onto leaves. And she rolls up into this movie, man, and it's just like her eyes are always moving. She's just taking everything in, and she orders a pack, uh, or she orders, she asks for a pack of cigarettes, and um, they, they hand her the cigarettes, and she, there's this whole to-do about like, oh, I don't have any money, and she has some money in her sock, and she's like, you know, for emergencies, and hands it over. And she says, now, where did you say I was again? And the, the whole gimmick is that they're telling everyone it's Arkansas. And then Betty Gilford just grabs Amy Madigan's face, jams her down into the, uh, into the countertop, knocking her backwards. And then she just starts fucking laying waste to the old dude, shoots him with the sawed-off shotgun from under the counter. And... <laughs> Then says, uh, those are European tags on those cigarettes. You fucked up, bitch. And murders Amy Madigan in, gold, in cold blood. It is one of the most satisfying moments I, I've seen in a movie in some time. I love it. I, I love her shooting Amy Madigan in the face and telling her she fucked up. <laughs> and now I think... Even though that the movie has tricked us before, we know we've found our hero. Yes, yes. And and so the movie is kind of her adventure trying to get, you know, out, out of this situation and to safety for the most part. Like, um, you know, I, I, not to go scene by scene or anything, but like, there, there's a to do with like she runs into Ethan Supley and she overhears some stuff on the radio. So she's starting to get an idea of who's behind this. 
and there's some business with them taking a train and and running uh, like finding a car that has uh muslim refugees in it and ethan supley wisely sniffs this out and he's like no there's no way that's true like what are the odds oh uh, and these are all crisis actors this is where he calls the baby a crisis baby and you know like yes they're all stereotypes for the most part um but it's you know it, it's both sides you know like the, the the liberals are just as much stereotypes as the conservatives are in this film with the exception of kind of the two main women who are very much their own people and athena uh, and crystal athena and crystal yeah and athena of course is is hillary swank um and so it the movie is kind of the the journey of betty gilpin to this final confrontation with athena and along the way there's there's a terrific scene where she murders all the other liberal bleeding hearts who have come to kill conservatives um where they have kind of holed up in a bunker in finely pressed fatigues man that <laughs> that kerchief the dude's wearing oh it is god damn it is so good all the camouflage they're wearing and stuff i mean it's just it's so clearly an affectation uh, uh like this is something they would never 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 wear except in a situation where they are hunting human beings um th thanks to the training of some national reservist <laughs> oh it's so good i'm in the shit now that's a good way to look at it um <laughs> yeah and she just like when she first goes in like uh they throw a a, a pig down these the steps to distract all the liberals uh and then she comes down the steps and starts with hey bitch <laughs> and then just start shooting everybody um some highlights here her fight with the national reserve guy is really good and there's one dude that she is fighting with a rifle or fighting with over a rifle and he yanks the clip out of it and gives her this like real smug smirk like aha i took all your bullets and she eases back uh the the slide on the on the rifle to show that there's like a bullet in the chamber and then she gives him a look back that's like huh you know you kind of fucked up there i just need one <laughs> right and then just murders him she kills one dude who runs away by shooting him with a 50 cal there's the woman who uses the bow and arrow that uh somebody that she's with a guy named don and she says look, you want to ask her any questions? I know you were real upset when I killed the last one. <laughs> and, and he's like, why are you doing this? And, uh, and the, the girl that they, that uses the bow and arrow says, uh, because Jesus told me to. And Betty Kilpin says, uh, now do you think that I should show you any kind of mercy just because you're a woman? And the girl goes, no. And so Betty Kilpin just puts a bullet in her head just immediately shoots her it is fantastic uh and then like you said there's the conversation with the uh the national reservist where they have this whole back and forth about you know like she was in afghanistan and this is the point too man this is like where you get the real nice character moment where betty and it's the moment i fell in love with both this character and betty gilpin as an actress for being able to pull this off where she says hang on let me get this right because i've got this in my notes uh yeah here we go she says uh when the guy is like why are you doing this like are, are you uh, is is there something wrong with you and she says you know just sometimes i'm like and then she gives this like kind of bug-eyed look like i'm going crazy a little bit and and then she says you know i can't do anything with that uh, at my day job behind the counter of a car rental place. So maybe this is the one time I can, I can, you know, and then she gives the same look again. Like I've just got all this shit inside me and I am going to empty it in, in this battle. 
Yeah. It is. Oh man, it's so good, Darren. I love this so much. I love this whole scene. It's bloody and wonderful, and it's capped by this really wonderful little character moment. I would be surprised when they start making movies again. I hope that she catches on to some of this stuff because she's, I mean, she's great. She's really good in glow. She plays, I think her character wrestling character's name is Liberty bell. And she's all about America. (laughs) And, uh, you know, her girl that she's known really long time plays the Russian type character. So they've got that rivalry going on. And this made me go back and check out the first season again. Because I feel like I didn't pay enough attention to her. Yeah, I mean, she just makes such interesting choices. Sometimes it feels a little, you know, hoity-toity to say that about an actor. But she does. She just, it's all these little looks and, and the way she delivers certain lines and that kind of thing. Like, it's just her owning this character in a way that, like I said, it's totally satisfying. And you get on her side, even though she is a maniac in this movie. She, Like I said, she's murder on two legs. She just does nothing but lay waste to every single motherfucker she runs across. But there is something so compelling and funny and likable about her. Um, There's a friend of mine that I went to high school with. In fact, she and I dated when we were in high school. And after I saw this movie, I was like, you need to see this because this character reminds me so much of you. You know, there's this, like, barely contained rage that at some point is going to spill out, and when it does, you're going to love it. You know, that it's not like, I've got to do this to stay alive. It's like, i got to do this to fill this hole inside of me. And in so doing, it may end up killing me, but I'm going to go through with it. I'm I, I have to kill. It's, oh, God damn, it's good. <laughs> Then she goes to uh, she tracks down Athena, Hillary Swank, because like she's murdered everybody else and goes to uh, her her place, this rental cottage or you know rental manor uh, in Croatia or wherever the fuck they are. Um, and Hillary Swank is like gives basically the James Bond villain speech. Here's why I did this. And, and it turns out that the reason that Hillary Swank went all cuckoo is that after this text chain, one of the people on that text chain about like the manner and killing all the deplorables, um, his phone got hacked or his Twitter account or whatever got hacked. And this exchange was made public and everybody lost their jobs and was kicked out of, you know, either had to resign or was fired as a result because they could not be high level corporate entities and be perceived as having these super left-wing politics and not just left-wing politics, but threatening violence, you know, and joking about violence. And it's totally understandable. Like if, if uh, Jeff Bezos got busted with this kind of text chain, they'd probably oust him, you know, as, as important and rich as he is, uh, you, you can't get away with saying shit like that. This isn't a country, it's a company. Yeah, yeah, like there's a flashback where she's being fired, and and yeah, that line is fantastic. And so she's explaining all this, and, and so you get a, another flashback where it's the group of liberals that we've seen just get murdered who um, are going through files and basically picking out people who have posted outrageous shit online or whatever. And and believe in this whole manner gate is what they call it. Um, they they much like Pizza Gate, you know, like there are people uh, who believe this crazy conspiracy theory. And then Betty Gilpin kind of laughs and she says, "You fucked up." And then reveals that where in the town she was born, there were two crystal maze. One of them is spelled differently, and she says. You know, so it, it's an honest mistake. Sometimes I get her mail. But yeah, that she's not she's not the person who posted all this shit online. And it basically has been hunted uh, inappropriately. Then she says, look, I don't want to interrupt your uh, 
your grilled cheese speech because Hillary Swank has a whole thing about the perfect grilled cheese sandwich. And she says, uh, I don't want to interrupt your grilled cheese speech, but can we get the fuck on with this? And then Darren. Oh, I can't wait to hear you talk about this. Then comes a fight that is, it's, it's as epic as say your Keith David's and Rowdy Roddy Piper's from uh, They Live is maybe like it is almost a the raid level fight sequence and that is high praise indeed from me Darren. <laughs> <laughs> but it is like it's one of those fights that starts in the kitchen goes up the stairs comes back down goes out a window comes back in there's even an intermission where, like, after they go through a window, both of them are kind of fucked up and are just like, all right, just wait a second. Just everybody, let's just take a, take a second here and catch our breath. And it is brutal. It is satisfying. Like, one of my favorite things is there's a point where they, they say they're going to fight without weapon or without guns and are just trying to stab each other and whatnot. But then Hillary Swank grabs this big like elephant fucking gun and <laughs> takes a takes a shot at Betty Gilpin. But then they start fighting over the uh, the gun as Hillary Swank tries to reload it. And there's a point where the the gun is kind of broken open to reload. And Hillary Swank closes it on Betty Gilpin's arm. And which elicits two things. One, it stretches her skin in a way that's like, God damn, that looks like it hurt. Also, Betty Gilpin's response is, fuck you. <laughs> oh, God, it's good. This whole fight is fucking amazing. Like, if, if the movie weren't already good, um, this this fight scene alone would be like, well, you need to watch it for this. You know, like, you need to at least see this fight scene. Um, it's fantastic, man. And it, and it, it kind of culminates with them, um, stabbing each other with like a juicer blade. Yeah. And... I think we used to call it the robo coop when, uh, last time I did prep in a restaurant. Yeah. And it, it's one of those. And they like, uh, Betty Kilpin gets stabbed with it. And then she hugs, uh, Hillary Swank to her. And it, like Hillary Swank, when she stabs her, she's like, ha ha, I got you. And then uh, Betty Gilpin kind of turns the tables and stabs her right back. And then they flip over, leaving the blade in Hillary Swank, who seems to be injured much worse. And Betty Gilpin, as they're both on the floor, just lying there bleeding, says, huh, I got you too. It's fantastic. And then there's uh, th like at one point, Hillary Swank calls betty gilpin snowball and she says uh hey while we're just lying here why did you call me snowball and hillary swank says well it's from animal farm it's uh it's one of the pigs from animal farm and uh betty gilpin says yeah yeah i know that but why snowball snowball was the idealist he just wanted to make the world a better place that's why the other pigs demonized him and uh, you know, I think you're Snowball. And Hillary Swank goes, "You read Animal Farm," <laughs> <laughs> and and then says, "So you know, since we're both dying here, you can be honest with me. Did I really get uh, the wrong person?" And Betty Gilpin's delivery of this is so good when when she says, "No, ma'am, you did not." And then Hillary Swank and Hillary Swank says whoops and then <laughs> dies it's great man it's a great death it's a great fight it's a great conversation before they die and it's a great death it's a fucking great like that scene cut basically from the point where betty gilpin starts killing everyone in that bunker to the last frame of this movie it is a just non-stop joy um because after after she after Hillary Swank dies, she gets up, uh, uses a uh, like a, a creme brulee torch to seal her wound, dresses in one of Hillary Swank's fancy dresses, puts on some heels, grabs the 1907 bottle of champagne, and hits the plane, and goes home. 
for those who have heard the jackrabbit and the box turtle story, she also <sighs> eats her fucking lunch every last bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. She, I, I think it's Ethan. Is it Ethan Supley that she tells that story to of the 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 tortoise and the hare? Only the hare goes to the tortoise's home after and kills his family in front of him and shit. Well, Ethan Supley's there, but he is no longer living. It's to a bub. Oh, or that's Don, right. To Don. Don. Yeah. <laughs> Hunted like Don. Oh, man. Did you yeah, happen? It... Oh, sorry. Yeah, no, I was just going to say, like, at the end of the fight, uh, a rabbit shows up and makes Betty Gilpin, like, laugh and get up when she sees the the jackrabbit who is the fucking murderer. <laughs> <laughs> Did you look up who the stunt coordinator and fight coordinator was? I didn't. Who was it? Uh, her name's Heidi Moneymaker. Uh-huh. I had never heard of her, but I've seen her a billion fucking times. This was, I think, the second movie she did the stunt coordination for. Uh-huh. Uh, she also did the fight coordination for that Mulan movie that's coming out. Okay. But she did stunts in all the John Wick movies. Sure. She's Scarlett Johansson's stunt double in all of the Marvel movies, at least as far back as Iron Man 2. Uh, I She probably, I don't think, I don't think uh, Scarlett Johansson was in the first Iron Man, but yeah, the first Avengers movie. What else did I see? The 2009 Star Trek. That makes so much sense. Hancock. Yeah, way back. I mean, Beer Fest. She did stunts for Beer Fest, apparently. Mr. and Mrs. Smith. National Treasure. I mean, she's been doing stunts for fucking ever and yeah she did the fight coordination and the stunts for this movie it's fucking outstanding yeah and uh the they did almost all of the fight scene themselves they barely had any stunt doubles and you can very much tell like the, like the camera does a nice job of letting you know like oh no 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 this is them um there are a couple of times where you're like okay that almost clearly was not hillary swank but um yeah most of it like it feels there was never a point where i was like ah, that's a stunt man you know or stunt stunt woman um it's just it, like it's so well done uh craig uh zobel 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 one of the two um <laughs> is the director of the film um who is uh geez he directed like a really good westworld episode um he what was the movie he did that i can't think of now um hang on i will i will find our our friend craig zobel's uh film it, there was one uh compliance oh compliance. was the one i never saw that one yeah and that's a pretty good movie and then he did z for zachariah with uh chiwetel Ejiofor. i feel like i saw his name attached to american gods at some point Yes, which Betty Gilpin was also in, and I I started to go down the rabbit hole to see if she was in one of the episodes that he, or if she was in the episode that he directed, which would have made sense for him to cast her uh, in in this. But yeah, he's done a, mostly television, uh, also directed some Iggy Pop and, and the Stooges videos, which, you know, fucking right on. One might say that Craig Zobel has a lust for film. (laughs) Here comes Craggy. Yeah. (laughs) It's got 35 mil. Technicolor. Anyway. um, Yeah, it's... The pigs. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) I got a million in budget gonna leave me alone if i stay under budget (laughs) yeah and that's kind of the you know it's it's the love hate i have with blumhouse is that they're just like ah here's three million dollars see what you can do and and sometimes that's great like you know the invisible man and get out and stuff like that and this and then sometimes you get fantasy island you know it's a real crapshoot with those folks but (laughs) Um, yeah, it's hard to believe that Fantasy Island and The Hunt both came out from the same production company in the same year. 
Um, one of them is fucking dreadful, and the other is one of my favorite movies I've seen in the past couple of years. Uh, this, I mean, this honestly, The Hunt is on my short list for the best thing I've seen this year. Um, and 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 I guess maybe I should get into like what I drew from the film that makes me love it so much. Um, before I do that, though, I'm gonna run and pee real quick. So hang on one sec. A few moments later. So what? What I like most about this movie, and again, you know, I, I said this up front, but I, I like I like the movie because I agree with it, and I think that the movie's complaints or the complaints that it received for being kind of toothless was because it wasn't taking a left or right position. It was in that way, it was kind of an equal opportunity offender, and and just took you know let's face it some of those jokes are low-hanging fruit but not a lot of not a lot of movies make it so <laughs> I, I i think it was you know kind of brave uh on that level the other thing is i think what the movie is ultimately saying it is it, it comes down to the snowball thing right like if, if your idealism is pushed to the point where you begin to demonize the other side then that creates a toxic situation where neither side is advanced and all that's left is just you know murder and mayhem that as soon as you start you know like uh for uh for hillary swank and her pals they became what they beheld right like they they you know there's this really funny back and forth where uh hillary swank is like and then they thought that we had this manner and were hunting people down. And Betty Gilpin is like, yeah, you were. And she's like, no, but I didn't do it then. They, you know, like I did it only after they thought I did it. And she's like, I look, I just, yes, you're doing it. What do you like? What do you want? And, and to me, that is the real like poison of our current political climate is that, from both sides, it has become so utterly tribal and so utterly, uh, uh, like, there, there is such a, a venom uh, when, when it comes to anyone else's beliefs, especially um, a contrary political belief, that all that's left is the mayhem. You know, like there's no, there's no discussion. There's no changing minds. There's no, um, there, there's no compromise in any of that. It's all just, you know, I'm going to own the libs on one side and, and they're deplorable on the other. And I know it sounds like it's a uh, cliche to, you know, use that deplorable comment, but let's be honest, that came from the presidential candidate in 2016 called a segment of the population deplorables. Um, and that is no better and no worse than, you know, the people on the right who, who say that, you know, godless socialists are, are going to come take your guns. Neither of them are true. Neither of them are, neither of them reflect the reality of the situation. Um, I, would, I would be so excited about the Joe Biden that the Republican Party says Joe Biden is. Yeah, I have to say, yeah. If he was a crazy radical leftist that's gonna, you know, end police brutality and I forget all the other fun stuff that they everybody says everybody that doesn't right. like him says he's gonna do. No police, hates God, hurts God. Will end you know, God in America. Yeah, that kind of shit. Um, but it goes back to like even during the Obama presidency. You know, I used to have the conversation all the time where people would be like, he's just a socialist. I'm like, I wish, <laughs> I wish he was. I'm a democratic socialist. Barack Obama is a centrist. Yes. Um, yeah, like I think he's a good president at the end of the day, but he he doesn't necessarily reflect my my more extreme views. And and right, I mean, I mean, I think you're absolutely right. Like the the presentation of joe biden as some kind of like the puppet of the left thing i think is, is is pretty funny uh i will see how it works it could work like i, I don't want to take it too too lightly because that shit has a way of biting me in the ass but i i just don't think that sticks 
I was I was drinking confidently on election night, and then I began drinking in sadness. Yes, right. Like as soon as Pennsylvania went, it was like, oh fuck, we are we are in some trouble here, folks. That was the point. I just turned it off, and I was like, you know what? I'm gonna go to bed, and I'll wake up in Trump's America tomorrow. But yeah, like Joe Biden is, you know, th- there are plenty of things that you can say critically of Joe Biden. Um, I do believe that he's a decent guy at heart. Um, I do feel for him. Like, I don't think you can be a person who, you know, lost the majority of your family plus your adult son and not have some measure of compassion. And I'll tell you, here's a, here's a moment I, I teared up at the DNC. It was the speech, uh, that the, the kid gave who was the stutterer. Oh, right. The, the high school kid, right? Y- yeah. Or and junior high, high school. Yeah maybe junior high he seemed young but everybody does to me these days but (laughs) um but yeah i mean this this kid who had a stutter and got on you know national fucking television to deliver a speech is like there's something heartwarming about that to begin with and then when you realize that um the reason he's doing this is because the the presidential candidate and if you haven't seen it go back and watch because it was called on film the moment where joe biden met this kid uh if you haven't seen that video it'll it'll break your heart in the right way all over again where joe biden like hugs the kid and is like look you're a strong kid you're a handsome kid don't let this define you i look i were and this is what he says he says I work with about 15 stutterers regularly. Is it okay if I call you? And then he goes, hey, dad, is it okay if I call him? And I mean that. Is it okay? And his father's like, yeah, of course it's all right. And, like, you can argue all you want that that is cynical politics, that he is doing that for the optics, to which I say, even if that's true, that is far preferable to the the optics on the other side which is is so much more like isolating and and so much more fearful like yes i will take a disingenuous nice guy over a completely genuine asshole any day of the week (laughs) and uh you know again like i uh, there are plenty of criticisms of joe biden that are, are completely accurate I have plenty of them myself. He is not my dream candidate. Uh, I think I've said it before, maybe even on this show, I was an Elizabeth Warren guy. Um, I was ride or die for Elizabeth Warren. It, it, it hurt when she got out of the race. I thought she was the most qualified, intelligent person on that stage. Um, but, uh, you know, I mean, like I said, I'll, I'll take a guy, I'll take the old man who is trying, you know, like he fucks up and says some dumb shit all the time. But the one thing I will give Joe Biden is that I think he's trying, like he is of a generation that never thought they were going to live in a world where, you know, gays could get married (laughs) and there were, you know, uh, like the, the culture has changed so substantially during Joe Biden's lifetime. The fact that he is, as progressive a politician as he is, is fucking remarkable. And the fact that he is, he has shown that like ever since getting the nomination, his platform has shifted dramatically to the left to make sure that he shored up that end of the party. Again, you can call that cynical politics. I say, who gives a shit? That's still the most progressive candidate we have ever had in the history of this country. And, and, and I, any, any progressive, any liberal that doesn't vote for Joe Biden is just being either either selfish or willingly ignorant. And and you know, you can you can do the both sides are terrible, both both ends of the political spectrum are bad. You know, I I I my argument against that is and remains like look at what has happened over the past 4 years. If that had been a uh, a Hillary Rodham Clinton presidency. Do you think we would have built a wall do you, or tried to? Do you think we would have stopped DACA? Do you think we would have handled the uh, pandemic this shittily? You know, like all of those things would have been substantially better. 
than what we had with Trump. And if you think that four years from now, if we elect Trump again, that things won't be substantially worse than if we elected Joe Biden for the causes that I think most of the people who listen to this show believe in, then who do you think, like, do you think Trump's going to somehow circle his way <laughs> to progressive? Like he's going to go so far right, he's going to end up on the left. You yeah. know what that is? That's fucking Nazism is where where he's headed. <laughs> like now that I don't have to play to my base, I'm going right. to <laughs> Now that I don't have to do a fucking shit to make anybody happy or comfortable, you know, like, uh, you know, the, the, the backpedaling that he's done on just some of the pandemic stuff when he says something fucking crazy and, and there's at least a little bit of pushback and he, and because he wants to be reelected, he'll, he'll kind of bend to the will of like science and reason. But only when he has to, only when he feels like it's it's politically advantageous to him. And again, I you know, whatever complaints you have about about Joe Biden or the Democratic Party or whatever, I I think that you know if you believe that you know something should be done to address the the uh, racism in this country and 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 economic inequality in this country and and uh, you know, the growing health crisis in this country. Um, if you think that Donald Trump is somehow better an alternative than Joe Biden, I, I, I mean, I, I, I just can't reason my way through that. And, and the notion that maybe we should just abstain because they're both, it's the lesser of two evils. It's like, well, fucking welcome to the real world, everybody. And most of the time, it's the lesser of two evils. Have you been a person for long? And yeah, sometimes you, you got to hold your nose and pull the, the ballot or pull the lever for somebody that isn't your ideal. But who the fuck is? Um, you know, like, hey, if, if I keep saying this, if, if everybody who believed in Bernie and and I like I would much rather be supporting Bernie Sanders right now than Joe Biden if, if push came to shove. But if everyone who who bitched and moaned about Bernie Sanders getting the shaft had actually gone out and voted for him, he would be the nominee. You know, all these fucking Twitter assholes who who want to talk about how they're not going to vote for anybody because Bernie didn't win. You know, just grow the fuck up. Sorry. I, I just, it, it pisses me off so much that th there's this like selfish, childish, petulant, if I didn't get my way, I'm going to take my toys and go home and whatever happens to the country happens to the country. That, that kind of attitude drives me so fucking crazy. You know, sometimes you don't get the best of all world, all, all worlds. You don't get the guy or girl that you wanted, but you still do the thing that is going to be the best for the most people because that's the way that we make progress. We do it a little bit at a time, uh, one year at a time, every four years at a time. Uh, and, and, and it's frustrating and it's slow. And, and I certainly don't want to come to the end of my life, which gets closer every fucking day. Um, living in a country that is totalitarian, that is isolationist. And the only way that we're going to get out of that is to again hold our nose and elect some old fucking white guy that nobody's all that excited about, but is drastically better than Donald Trump. Sorry. No, it's fine. I told this. I said this. This is my soapbox, and I share it. Uh, we agree on many, many things. It is so fucking frustrating that I feel like my entire voting life in a purple state, or I, I don't know, it could be red, and I'm living in denial, but. You know, Columbus, Cleveland, and Cincinnati tend to go blue. And, you know, like our our city government is almost entirely Democrats and independents. So we've got a good Democratic Socialist Party here, not a lot of good candidates or, you know, not a lot of good positions. We had some good candidates. We had a write-in uh, run against the mayor uh, last election, did really well for a write-in but it can feel so frustrating to always have to 
plug the nose, <laughs> vote for the old fuddy duddy. Mm-hmm. When it see when you know like this this time around, I feel, and yeah, I I'm sure some of this is sour grapes, but I feel like they the Democratic National Committee is trying harder to get the handful of undecided Republican voters and not going hard for the people that they expect to come along with them anyway. Mm. When, and I never got, I was never actually, actually I got shouted out at by like a, you got to go with the party uh, person. You know, you just have to deal with it. He's the most electable person, but you have to do everything you can to help this person because he's not as electable as I said he was. But it, it it can just get frustrating. I will say that. Yeah, of course. I mean, there is no doubt about it. Again, let me let me sing you a song about John Edwards, um, <laughs> <laughs> who at the time when I was when I was a young man uh, was you know progressive. He was the guy who who made the the Two America speech when he was running for president. Looked like the next Kennedy, and then it turned out couldn't keep his dick in his pants. Like the next uh, Kennedy. Like a Kennedy, except, you know, he kept it under wraps long enough to get elected. But uh, but yeah, I mean, yes, you're right. It sucks. Um, I do think, though, that the Biden platform has shifted left since he got the nomination because of the progressive wing of the party. Like his stance on health care now is way more progressive than it was when he started. I will. Give uh, you, yeah, I, I will go i will i will go with that i think that i mean you're right that it would be great to have a a truly progressive candidate that was unapologetic that didn't give a shit about the middle but then you have to start thinking about what it takes to win and you know do i want do i want joe biden to uh, pander is the wrong word. Cater, maybe, because pander makes it sound like you know he doesn't really want to go there. Um, and Biden's an old dude, you know. In some ways, he doesn't like the the idea of just uprooting the uh, the healthcare system in America. I'm sure scares the shit out of him. Um, but you know, he's he's getting there. And I think the one thing he's shown as a candidate is that he's he's willing to shift his policies towards the the direction of the party you know um he is the bus that'll get you closer to where you're wanting to go i think in in that analogy that i've yes you know and also not to cut you off but when we are talking about this we should probably do a little bit about joe jorgensen or jorgensen and howie hawkins uh, I just have a little something to say about each one of them and get your thoughts on that because sure, sure, you know, with the third parties, I feel like it's always a, a little bit more so with the age of information where it doesn't cost so much. Yeah. But I, you know, when I was coming up, I felt like every presidential election you found out that there was more than two parties. But other than that, you didn't really see much down down the bench or how, however they say it. You know it. Not so many governors, con- Congress people. It's kind of a m- monopoly of the two parties, and everybody needs to work on it a little bit. But I, I, we, we, I'm sure we both know some people that are into Joe Jorgensen, Jorgen, Jorgensen, right? Jorgens hand lotion, son. Yeah. Who wants to have have the healthcare system as it is right now regulated less? Who wants to take funding out of mental health care? Who wants to let the free market fix all the problems? And mm-hmm. uh, some other, I, I did one of those I stand with quizzes or whatever where you answer up to 100 fucking questions on political views. And I think I cut 6% or 12% agree with her. And mostly it was just about drugs and lack of war but her stance on health care is terrible mm-hmm. and i think she's in like most libertarian presidential candidates except for vermin supreme are into private prisons i don't know if she is or not but i've i've seen her name tossed around i was like yeah well you know she she stands for things and it's like well i mean 
I don't know. I mean, she's not Trump or Biden, but I know that you probably don't like her platform on healthcare. <laughs> Yeah, I'm like, I'm just not a libertarian in any any way. I think that's horseshit. I because I believe in government, right? Like, I, I believe that government is there to help the people. And, you know, this libertarian, like, you don't tax me, stay out of my life. It's like, well, how the fuck are you going to get roads built? How are you going to get schools built how are you going to fill them with teachers how are how are you like all that kind of shit you got to take back a lot that got built up with the things you're trying to dismantle right like i mean that's the thing is the reason that there's so much like bureaucracy and red tape and and winding roads to get things done is because it's fucking complicated and i'm not saying it's right like a lot of that stuff can be cleaned up but uh, you know, like, like there is a reason that the government is what the government is. Um, you know, in, in some cases it is undeniably, you know, pork and, and money grabs and stuff like that. I'm not saying that, you know, the government is without fault clearly, but you know, the, like to your point about mental health care, like, you know, you can't leave it to the private market to deal with mental health issues and public health issues and stuff like that. Like if, if we were a purely capitalist society with no government to regulate anything, when the pandemic hit, businesses would just sell you masks at a premium and, and move on with their lives. Like we've had a shitty response, but it's better than no response at all. Um, I, I, I firmly stand against deregulated commerce I'm a big believer in a regulated Wall Street. I think that I think capitalism at its root is kind of shitty and evil. I don't know what the better solution is other than pure socialism. And that's something that I personally believe in. But I also believe we live in a world where there are enough assholes that socialism doesn't work in a pure form. So you have to have you have to have the the carrot for for a lot of people um beyond like well this helps your fellow man like i i believe in altruism i am i am an altruist at heart i i want i want people to do well and if i can help with that then i i want to do that there are some people who that is not their philosophy and that's why you have to have regulation um you have to you have to acknowledge the fact that other people don't believe what you do and and that's one of the the points of the hunt i think and it's one of the points that I think a lot of people on the left and the right miss is that we live in a world that has, or not even a world, we live in a country that has a wide array of, of points of view. And I live not even a purple country, then not even close. I am in a state that is plus 11 Trump uh, in the last poll. Um, most of the people I know are Republicans. Um, probably a good half of them at least have told me that they're going to vote for Trump again. And it, hurts. it doesn't make I, me as angry as it makes me sad. Yeah. I, and I'm kind of the same way. Like I disagree with it and I'll tell them like, I think the guy's kind of a huckster. Um, but I don't, I don't make it about them. You know what I mean? Like I, I don't tell them that they're wrong for believing something. And, and I find that by allowing them to express themselves in, in a, in a way that they, they can without me jumping down their throats about it. Um, I have more opportunity to engage them and ask them questions that might eventually change their mind. Maybe, maybe not, but uh, it, it, it serves no purpose at, at the end of the day. What I want is for the world to vote for a candidate that is going to, uh, further the interest of, of the human population. I want healthcare. I want good education and I want all of that to be free and accessible to everyone. I want there to be a just society that doesn't discriminate on the base of sex or race or sexual orientation you know, all those things that I hold dear, those, those kind of 60s revolutionary values that I grew up with and I still believe in, um, that kind of John Lewis, uh, you know, I believe in love over hate and that you you love 
you love the person who hates you until they stop hating. And that's how I try to live my life. And, and again, I, because I've said it, I, I stand by it. Um, I, I believe that I live in a world where other people may think that view is either naive or counterproductive or whatever, but it's the only thing that I've ever found that works. You know, I go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no, please continue. I was just going to say, I find it uplifting because I, I'm still an optimistic person, but I'm way less optimistic than I used to be some time ago. So it, yeah, uh, please, please continue to fill me with joy. Yeah, no, I mean, and it's tough. I mean, there are times when I get, I get as discouraged as anybody. Um, but I, you know, at the end of the day, I want those people who are voting for Trump to come around to my way of thinking and, and, and selfishly, I want them to vote, uh, for people who are going to further those causes. And the one way I know that will never happen is to tell them how stupid and wrong they were for doing it. You know, the, the thing that I've got to do as a person, as a human being relating to another human being is I have to say, you know what? I don't agree with that, but tell, tell me why you, tell me more about why you did that, you know? And I'm not going to make fun of you. I'm not going to be angry. I just want to know, like, what well, what was it about what Trump said? What, what spoke to you? And, you know, I've had those conversations. And like I said, you know, in some cases, I am making no headway at all. Uh, there are some people who are not political and just want to be part of a team. And, and don't care about the issues, don't care about the fact that they're, in some cases, voting against their own interests and that kind of thing. And you have to kind of accept that and go on. Um, you know, you, you fight the battles that make sense, right? You don't die on, on the hills for, you know. I know a guy that is like, I am voting for Trump because I love it when he says things that piss off the, the libs. And, and when I say you understand, I am one of those, right. That you're, you're voting for a guy that's just going to upset me and try to make me mad. Right. And, uh, and his response is, ah, you can take it. Um, <laughs> you know, like I can't do anything with that. There's no discussion to be had. It's just uh, like, he's doing it for a goof, you know, doesn't care about the politics of it. Doesn't ever enter his mind. And, and no matter how much I say like, well, you know, these decisions affect other people doesn't matter. You know, some people just aren't wired that way. But I also have friends who voted for Trump and are like, you know, he really fucked up this pandemic. And I'm like, yeah, he did. Go on. And and you can kind of coax them into that place where you can have a conversation about Trump's failings. And from there, you can say, well, maybe it would be better if if somebody else were president. And, and open the door to, to something else. And, and like I said, I live in, in a very red state. So the idea that Joe Biden is somehow not progressive is crazy to me because he is incredibly progressive to most of the people I run into and, uh, and, and, and aren't like, still haven't come around to the idea of universal healthcare and stuff like that. But that, but that's what you do, you know, again, you, you approach it with, with a sense of understanding and a curiosity, I find helps just a sense of like, tell me your story. Tell me, tell me what led you to you, the, the, the decision to vote for Trump and, and understand that I'm not going to judge you for that. Like I can hate Trump and, and what he stands for or what he doesn't stand for more realistically, but it doesn't mean I have to hate the person who supports him. And I, and, and like I said, I find that supporting, supporting that person and being the example, being the kind of person that's like, Oh no, you know what, you know what progressive values are about. It's about understanding and it's about love and it's about inclusivity. And for me to preach that and then exclude someone because of who they voted for, what a hypocrite that makes me. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I, I think you gotta, you gotta talk the talk and you gotta walk the walk. If, if you were saying, I want to live in a, in a more just society, that just society begins with you being fair and equitable to all your neighbors, even the ones you don't agree with. And, and sometimes that's hard and you know, that's the hard work of it. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, good Lord, I am 
let me make it clear. I am not comparing myself to John Lewis. John Lewis is an American hero. I am a schlub. But it doesn't mean that I can't look to John Lewis as an example and say, you know, it's the story that you heard over and over and over and over again at his funeral about the guy who had beat him in Selma coming to his office decades later and apologizing and the two of them hugging and crying together. And it's like, that's the win, you know, it took decades to get that win, but that's it. That's the point where, you know, like truly hate had become love. And, and it's something that I, as an old hippie, I, I firmly believe in. I, I think the only way out of this is, is through that, you know, and, and it's something that Biden said that, you know, sounds uh, quaint and it sounds uh, a little storybook, but the idea of like, yeah, this is, this is where the light has to start, you know, that we, we have to, we have to stop looking at the other side as being s somehow the enemy and, and start looking at them as these are people I disagree with, but they are, they are still Americans. They are still our brothers and sisters that by, by approaching them with open arms, that is going to get us so much further in, in our, in our journey to the country we want it to be than, than it ever will by saying that these people are, are they're the deplorables that they're ignorant that they're selfish and in some cases uh, that is a hundred percent true there are there are absolutely ignorant selfish hateful people out there and you know like we're just gonna have to live with that that's just the 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 cost of doing business in a free society but there's also people i think that we as as both a party and a and a movement are are pushing away from us with you know that kind of you know real snide twitter kind of attitude the of like can you believe the these the shit? yeah can you believe these fucking assholes you know like who whoever w would would think this was okay you know that kind of shit like th there's a time and place to call something out like the like the woman uh, uh calling the police on a black bird watcher uh, slash comic book writer, God bless him. Um, you know, that kind of thing needs to be called out. Is somebody, somebody saying it was somebody wearing a, a, a Trump Pence 2020 shirt doesn't need to be called out for wearing the shirt. You know, that's the, that's the kind of thing you see and you let it go. Because again, the, the, the thing that I think most people are missing is the, this knee jerk hypocrisy of, I, I I cannot be tolerant of people who are intolerant. And and that's the thing that I think gets lost so much is that if, if our if truly if our progressive movement is about helping as many people as possible and making the world as good as possible, then it doesn't matter what your political alignment is. We want all those people to come along with us. And it's our job. The 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 onus is on us to to convince them that it's the right thing to do and and we can't convince them by demonizing them and again i think that's kind of the point of the hunt is that if both sides are in this owning the libs versus deplorables conversation then nothing gets done you know the the reason that the the russian uh, attacks on our election work is because they're using that superman gene hackman lex luthor plan of we're nuking the fault lines you know we're stoking the division and one side or the other and i and i hope it's ours but one side or the other eventually has to say i don't care about the divisions anymore i don't i don't care that you believe something that that down deep in my soul, I think is wrong. I am not going to make you the enemy because of it. And, and that's what I hope for. That's what I want to see before I die. And I know I won't, I know I won't because that's, that's Nirvana and we're not there yet. <laughs> so anyway, speaking of soapboxes, that is me. That is me telling everyone, you know, to, to hug your neighbor.
as 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 opposed to to demonize them. And and it's a simple message, but it doesn't happen. You know, it's like the thing we were taught as kids, like everybody's different and you celebrate those differences. And it's something that you hear on the progressive party platform all the time is uh, we're, we're America is great because we celebrate everyone's differences because we're all different and we come together to create a very interesting dynamic culture. And, and a lot of times the, the progressive vision of that is, well, I mean, of course I mean minorities. I don't mean white Republicans. And eh, I mean, what a mixed message you're sending where a lot of that is just ignorance and, and, you know, political messaging for decades. But there's, there's part of it too, that is just like, you know, on the left, it seems like we celebrate every group except for the ones that don't agree with us. And it's our job to celebrate those too. You know, to say like part of the thing that makes our differences interesting isn't just the difference in the color of our skin. It's the difference in our political ideologies and it's the difference in our experiences and the difference in, in our values. And those things are need to be discussed as, as, you know, something that we embrace just like we embrace everything else that is different about our, our you know, American brothers and sisters. Um so yeah, I just I, you know it's it's one of those things that maybe I am too naive, maybe I am still too lost in the, in the 1960s. Um, but if if you ever were going to be like, what a time! This is 1968 all over again, and we if 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 we if we could correct one mistake of the 60s, it's that we don't abandon the root of our values, which at the end of the day, as far as I'm concerned, is that we want, we want to see our fellow men and women in this country do well. And we love them. And we want, we want them to be part of a happier country, a happier country and a, and a, and a wealthier country and a healthier country and a less, uh, a, a less incarcerated country and a, a more economically equitable country, like all of those things come from a place of love where the reason that we don't want, you know, black, black men in particular uh, thrown into jail as soon as they get out of, uh, out of high school is because we believe there's something wrong about that. And, and because we love them because they're humans and deserve dignity and respect. And we want them to have that. Uh, and, and that should be true of, of every, every person, every man, woman, and child in, in this country, whether or not they agree with us. And, and especially if they don't agree with us, that w- that we show them by our example, that we're not here to get you. We're not here to own you. We're not here to show you up. We're not here to make you feel bad. We are here so that at some point in the future that we can be, we can live in a country that is is truly a more perfect union, you know, that, that we can reach a place where all Americans are in it for each other. And it's not something that's taught on the right for the most part. Like that's a very aggressively libertarian and, and individualistic kind of political philosophy. Um, and like I said, I think it's our job to, to, to say, I don't agree with that. And, and I don't think it's successful as a political philosophy, uh, in a practical application. And, and then we have to show them, you know, we have to show them by, by being the example that we want to see. I can't really, (laughs) I, I can't really top that. You, you, mister have come in like a shining beacon of hope into my ears in my angry, (laughs) in my angry, angry room. And I was trying to think of something funny to say and just didn't know. I want to live in Bo Ransdell's world. Yeah. Well, me too. You know, cause we ain't there yet. And, and it's a dark time for this country. I just don't believe that we get out of it by being more cynical and more angry. You mean you don't get out by digging deeper? Yeah. Right. Right. You know, <laughs> um, it's a, you know, I, I was talking about this earlier. 
And um, uh, when we were doing the Morbid Mondays, and I was saying, like, you know, some of my output, like, I haven't, I haven't stopped podcasting or or uh, or anything over the pandemic, but there were a couple of months where my output was pretty low. Like, I was kind of maintaining the pick six, and that was about it. And it, and it was because I was incredibly depressed. I was I was really, um, I was really upset about the the way that the pandemic was being handled i was i was depressed about the number of people who were dying i was really depressed about the number of people who were denying the number of people who were dying and uh and it was really something i had to you know uh, in addition to talking to my therapist about it uh but it was something i had to kind of you know dig down and 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 really think about um what what i felt like the right approach was and and how I could make it make sense for me, but also find the optimism in it. And and I, I and I think it was that. It was just like, look, you know, it is understandable when if all I watched was Fox News and then I ran into me on the street who was you know, wearing a mask was really like hyper aware of social distance and, and being concerned about that kind of thing. And, and I would think I was an idiot too, you know, if I were the Fox news version of me, because that's all I'm hearing. And, and so I think we have to shift the blame where it belongs. We can't blame the person who watches Fox news. We have to blame Fox news you know, for being the cynical corporation that it is and, and pandering to a base and being a mouthpiece for an administration that doesn't seem to care about its citizens, uh, at least not their health and well-being. And, you know, and, and that's what made sense to me. And, and and again, we are not there yet. We do not live in Bow World. But um, I, I like I said, I think the way to get there is – uh, it, it is by evaluating ourselves as a progressive movement and trying to figure out why it is more people don't go along with this because if on paper they should, you know, like if you, if you, it, and it, and statistically it holds true that if you just tell someone without any political labels, the policies of the progressive platform, they support that in the majority. But as soon as you label it liberal or progressive, that's where the numbers go way down. Fuck that and, Obamacare. I got the Affordable Care Act. Yeah, right. Exactly. Exactly. And and so, um, but that ought to instruct us, right? Like that shouldn't frustrate us. That should teach us. And so we have to we have to say like, okay, well, it's not the label. It's the policy. So who gives a fuck about the label? Let's just get the policy. Let's say we're going to fix the bridges and the roads and improve mass transit and improve. Yeah. If other places have done it before. We don't even have to make this an abstract idea. Here is how this will be done. It's not going to be. I, I don't want my face chiseled into Mount Rushmore. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I just want this cool shit to happen. Right. Yeah, and, and being able to express yourself in a way that isn't a meme, you know? Like when somebody when somebody says, uh, I'm against defunding the police, um, what they're saying is, I'm against the idea of no police, you know? And, and so, like, being able to engage someone and say, like, oh, no, 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 I'm not talking about getting rid of the police— but let's talk about, you know, uh, how, what about uh, in non-life-threatening situations that you dispatch this other, uh, this other service that isn't a cop with a gun and flashing blue lights. It is someone trained to de-escalate a situation. Uh, like, you don't always have to send a cop with a billy club and a gun to a domestic abuse situation. You can send people who are trained to deal with domestic abuse. Um, you know, those kinds of things. And I think if you explain it in that way to most people, they kind of understand what that means. And it's, and maybe defunding the police is even the wrong phrase. Maybe it's just reprioritizing the police and it is maybe a way to put it that doesn't sound quite as, as scary, but regardless, whatever it is, like 
we just can't, you know, as, as a culture and as a movement, we can't get mired down in the labels and the, uh, uh, the sort of tribalism part of it, you, you know, of like, well, if you're, if you're not with me, you're against me. We can't get into that shit. We just have to keep pushing for the ideas. And it, and if the right reacts to an idea like defunding the police negatively, then we have to relabel it. We have to repackage it. We have to think about what it is that scares them about, uh, about that notion and, and try to present the idea in a way that, that makes more sense to them. And, and, and say to them, like, like I said, you know, we're not, we're not talking about banning police entirely. What we're saying is there are maybe better ways to handle certain situations other than a police response. Um, and I think that stuff goes a, a, a longer way. Um, and, and one other thing before, before I, I totally just pass out. Um, uh, another thing that I, I find troublesome is there is a there there is a habit there is a, a a a certain joy i think that happens in finding someone who has made a mistake and really dragging them for it i'll leave ben shapiro alone i'm sorry <laughs> well but particularly something that happened like 20 years ago you know, I'm not saying, yeah, I mean, there's plenty of fucked up shit that people do today that they should obviously be uh, criticized for. But as I said, in a spirit that I hope is more constructive. But um, one thing that really drives me crazy is, uh, you know, not to sound right wing. You know how I often sound like I'm I'm real right wing. Um, but this notion of, of cancel culture this is the thing that's going to end up fucking us in the long run. That this idea that everything that you ever did in your entire life has to be impeccable. Uh, because that's just not humanity. Like, we fuck up, we make mistakes. And further, sometimes it wasn't even a mistake. It was just what the world was at that time. And trying to judge past behavior by current cultural standards is fucking crazy. And if you don't believe me, wait 20 years and then see what your behavior today looks like to you then. Because morality and cultural norms and cultural standards are not a fixed thing. It is a constantly shifting landscape that is going to change beneath your feet. It's going to keep happening. It's what happened to Joe fucking Biden. It's why he tells stories about corn pop and shit. Um, it's, you know, it is the world moving on and sometimes you're hanging on to it and sometimes you don't. And, uh, there is a glee that comes, uh, from some people finding some little, some little kernel of, of some shit that somebody did years ago. And I don't mean fucked up stuff like, you know, Louis CK jerking off in front of comedians or something like that. Like that's rightfully terrible, but you know, like Ted Danson doing blackface in the eighties. It's like, yeah, that's unfortunate, but you know what? At the time, wasn't the craziest shit you ever heard. And you know, like Ted Danson, I, I don't think is being canceled now because of that. But, um, but that's a, a good example of what I mean that you just, you just can't judge someone on, on like, you can't judge every facet of someone's personality based on, something that happened at a time when the cultural norms said that there was nothing wrong with it, you know, like, like somebody using gay slurs or something like that in 1983, that it just happened, you know, or somebody using the word retarded or something like that, you know, you just, it's how that you kind... respond. Sorry. Yeah, no, no, no. Go ahead. You're right. I think it's how you respond when you're pressed on it, asked on it, when it shows back up in your life. If you're like, yeah, fuck you, that's a little bit different than like you're talking about, I feel. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think, you know, I, again, I keep using Biden as the example, but I think he's been pretty good at times about saying like, oh, I said something stupid. <laughs> I, I apologize for that. That's clearly not what I meant. And I want to learn and have a conversation about this. Um. 
And I, I like that's the thing that I think we have to allow for again as a society and it, and it kind of goes back to the root of just being more understanding and more forgiving and more loving as a society that when somebody says or does something fucked up and you're like hey that was fucked up if their response to it is yeah it was fucked up and so what yes by all means go after them but if their response is i didn't realize that was fucked up and will will you please explain how this hurt someone and so that I can correct that behavior and not do it again, you know, um, I think that makes a giant difference. I, I think you're right. I, I think that makes a, a world of difference. But you also see it all the time where, you know, uh, you know, somebody somebody did something five years ago or 10 years ago. And no matter how much they apologize or how much they regret it. It doesn't matter. Like it becomes a blood sport. And, and that's the kind of shit that I'm like, man, that, that's the kind of society that's going to end up cannibalizing itself. Right. Cause, because we're all flawed. We we're all going to make mistakes. And if, if some weird, like moral purity test is applied to all of us, we're all going to fail. You know, the only people left are going to be the arbitrators of that. Um, and that, that shit scares me. Like uh, as, as someone who has seen the, you know, a, a small sweep of history, that is something that is unique to this time that, you know, I think a lot of it is, is because of things like social media. There just never was a time in history where it was so easy to pile on someone. You read those articles that are like, you know, our brains just were never set up to handle things like the internet and social media you know like we're we're still dealing with kind of semi primitive monkey brains and that influx of information and that level of stimulation is kind of bad for us you know i'm like like i'm not trying to convince anyone not to use uh social media i i i think you're probably a happier person if you don't but <laughs> but uh i understand that it's you know a thing here to stay but i think our management of it is i don't know i think that's something that like we're gonna have to reckon with at some point is what is that doing to us as a uh, so, as a society and i think it's one of the reasons that you see so much of that kind of toxic demonization of other sides and stuff like that is you know you get a hashtag trend going and all of a sudden it's you know nothing draws a crowd like a crowd <laughs> and I, I i think that's a problem I, you know, I, I don't know where that is ultimately going to lead, but I, like I said, I think at some point we are going to have to, um, as a society, uh, have a bit of a reckoning with what the, the role of, of that kind of connectivity means for us. In the coming TikTok wars. Or whatever, like whatever replaces TikTok, you know, like how long was Snapchat around about a day and a half, it seems like shit you know google hangouts is fucking on the way out as well uh google what was that google plus is that what it was called google uh, plus i got a email that if i whatever i might get a dollar 50 as part of some class action lawsuit well but i mean even something like uh you like how facebook uses its users as co uh, a commodity you know like we have to reckon with that or otherwise it's just going to be this endless cycle of we're giving over our personal data so that we can be marketed to so specifically that we almost have no choice but to respond to it because of the psychological tricks they use um and then then what are we you know as a people are we just the consumers of our own interests like Animal Farm. I I don't know if it's been if you've read it recently. Uh it's been a while. It's probably been about fifteen years since I've read Animal Farm. It has not been that long since I've read it. But sort of like the end of the hunt. Mm-hmm. And sort of like right now, but in a different way. Because I love that she came out victorious at the end of the hunt. <laughs> yeah, of course the world you're talking about where just the shit isn't is cycling in the bad 
is you turn into with like Facebook and the corporatocracies or whatever dark cloud that nothing is turning into at this moment. There are you, me, many, many, many more people. And that's why we're socialists is that we're the horrified farm animals looking in the windows and the pigs are, you can't tell the pigs from the people. Yeah. 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 It, it, like I had a real problem for a long time with Amazon. Um, not, not as a company, although, you know, I've got plenty of problems with the, you know, the fact that they have almost single handedly destroyed small business, but, um, but I was part of that, right? Like I was, I was one of those knuckleheads that was like getting Amazon packages like two, three times a week, just buying all kinds of stupid shit. Cause it was easy, you know, it was easy. And, and Amazon knew the kind of shit I was looking for and, and would, you know, recommend like, Hey, you bought this movie. How about this movie? It's like, you know what? I've never heard of that movie, but I should probably buy it. Um, you know, and whatever it was like all kinds of stupid shit, like I said, and I really had to, you know, have a, one of those looking in the mirror moments of like, I am just buying to buy. I'm just being a pure consumer, you know, of, of media and, and items that I don't need. I don't necessarily even really want them. You know, it, it's just this, it, it, it was the cycle of it, you know? And, um, yeah, it, it's weird to think that, like, that's only going to get worse. You know, we're only going to be giving more of ourselves online, and all of that stuff is going to be used to continue to market to us so that we continue to consume, you know, and we become that they live culture, <laughs> you know. Um, and, and yeah, you know, I mean, I look, I worry about all kinds of things, but that's that's one of the biggies is, is the, the notion that, we are basically breeding ourselves uh, to be just pure consumers. And, and you know, like the politics of that, uh, I, I don't think that anyone on the right uh, in a position of power, I don't know that's as insidious as that is the grand plan, but certainly because of that sort of love affair that the right has with capitalism, uh, nobody's in a rush to stop it. And, you know, uh, again, in my hippie utopia, uh, at a certain point, like, eh, maybe, maybe you don't need a giant website where you can buy literally everything. Maybe, maybe a website that sells wagons and a website that sells movies. Maybe those should be distinct things. Yeah. Like the companies in rollerball. Right. <laughs> Yes. Uh, you know, or, or demolition man where there's only, only taco bells. Um, <laughs> uh, but, uh, but yeah, so, you know, go vote everybody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We have found ourselves at the end of the hunt. Yes. Well, have we, I mean, well. at the end of the movie, yes. But as a society, aren't we just in the midst of it? So, mm. 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 <laughs> but, uh, man, I look, I, first of all, let me apologize to the listeners, uh, for just spewing, uh, my, my political and moral philosophy. But, uh, if you are interested in joining my cult, the membership fees are reasonable and we have nice robes. It doesn't hurt to give a little bit to Legionnaires Relief on your way in. That is certainly true. Uh, we have a GoFundMe. You can find it uh, over on the Facebook group page. You can find it on the website. Um, we are, we have, we've been able to, uh, you know, I didn't send it to you guys. I should have, but I've got my uh, Lambda Legal uh, stickers um, from our, our support of that organization as well as um, we supported that. We supported the Atlanta small business owners fund, um, which most recently um, I got a, a notice that they were, um, they were expanding. They were, they were uh, offering some small loans for people to start businesses now. Nice. Uh, yeah. 
right? And uh, as well as being able to, you know, help a few individuals directly. So, um, and the, the only reason we can do that is because uh, good people like uh, the ones listening to this program who, uh, speaking of altruism, in a time of, of economic uh, turmoil, um, took it upon themselves to contribute some of their hard-earned money so that they entrusted it to us to to spend some of their money to try to help others and uh, and we we hope we've done that you know I I think we have I think we have um, every little bit yeah yeah both both individuals and in larger organizations so if you are um, if you're interested in in helping out then then please contribute there and uh, and of course you know subscribe to the podcasts on Legion podcasts including. Uh, this one right here and the the VD Clinic, uh, both fine fine shows that I appear on when you guys forget what it's like to have me on. Oh, we would have you on more often. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it, like that's really me. Like the the fact that I just come on VD Clinic to talk about murder <laughs> is you need it every once in a while. You know, it can't all be love, uh, Darren. Sometimes it has to be. Uh, you know, bondage and bloodletting, um, <laughs> which is the name of my first album. It's a prog rock album. I think you're really gonna like it. Nice. Also found on Legion LegionPodcast.com. That's right. Uh, you can find everything on LegionPodcast.com. Uh, speaking of being a consumer, uh, check out our merch page <laughs> where you can buy a uh, a Legion Podcast T-shirt inspired by the Grizzly film poster. Uh, which is maybe my favorite thing we've ever sold. I need to check that out. Today's Stammering by Darren has been brought to you by I don't know how many cups of coffee drank out of my Legion mug. Nice. Yeah, Legion mug, man. I got I got one of those, too. That's all right. I like that mug a lot. It's in heavy rotation. Yeah, I that one, and I've got one that an old girlfriend gave me that says, I have a thing for you. And it's uh, the thing uh, being pulled apart, like the thing head separating uh, with some hearts around it. Oh, so, nice. yeah, she was a good gal. Coffee is good. People can be good. Yeah. At the end of the day, like, I, you know, it, truly that is that is my overarching philosophy is that even when people don't agree with you, it doesn't mean they're bad. It just means they don't agree with you. They can still be wonderful people. Like I said, I, I, I have no choice but to live my life in such a way that I have very dear friends who I disagree with politically completely more, more than, uh, I, I, I thought I could. And, uh, it, but it doesn't mean I love them any less, you know, just means we don't agree about some things. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Like people uh, continuing with my half ass coffee analogy, I prefer my people sweet and fresh rather than ground up and in my freezer. You know, depends on what you're cooking. Uh, yeah, I don't know where I'm going. I am, I am getting delirious from all of this shocking optimism you have thrust in my face, sir. Yeah, I mean, but but honestly, like. It, it, <laughs> if everyone believed this, Darren, if everyone adhered to this philosophy of just thinking about the other guy just a little bit more, uh, sorry to dip into my Jimmy Stewart, but that's <laughs> exactly where I get that, um, that it, it, if we all just gave each other the benefit of the doubt, if we all just cared about each other just a little bit more, just a little bit, not a lot, just a little bit, uh, we, we could be in something like heaven. That is a much more eloquent way to say, put your money where your mouth is instead of your mouth where the money is. I mean, look, I'm not saying a blowjob ain't friendly. <laughs> That's why I never understood cocksucker as an insult. Yeah, no, I mean, that. To, you're in a pinch. A cocksucker is going to save your life. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're getting ridiculous. Thank you. Do you have anything else you, you want to you wanna talk about? Uh, I'll tell you, let me let me pimp uh, Pick Six Movies one more time. Uh, it is a show that uh, I do uh, bi-weekly with my old pal Chad, who I went to, uh, met him in kindergarten. I did, me and Chad. And that is uh, uh, a little over 40 years ago at this point. 
and uh we've been friends uh all our lives and we we talk about movies in a way that i think is very entertaining and very funny and i gotta say that the last season we did uh on television uh shows that were turned into movies is maybe um some of the finest podcasting i've ever done in my life i almost bought dukes of hazard to see if it was as bad as you it's said it so was bad. but i didn't know if i wanted to spend the five dollars don't don't it's it yes it is as bad as we say it is and we made it way more entertaining than it really uh it really is as a film episode one uh james bond in goldfinger is Ooh. the the first episode of the next season coming out strong right out of the gate uh-huh stink finger <laughs> That's a preview of a joke I'm certain to make on the episode. <laughs> and until I listen to it, I'm just going to fill my phone up with weird pictures that I think I'm going to manipulate around what I think you're going to be doing. Perfect. And, yeah. Because uh, yeah. I enjoy. I enjoy <laughs> propaganda. <laughs> just as much uh, as yeah. anybody. Yeah. I mean, who doesn't? If, if uh, Speaking of Orwell, uh, you know, who doesn't like a little propaganda? keeps the days warm when napoleon has taken all of your eggs and drank all your beer and stolen your dogs and sold <laughs> boxer to the knackers boxer to the knackers my second prog rock album <laughs> <laughs> don't forget to fucking duck and cover everybody thank you bo i'm glad we got to catch up i don't know if you have to go right now but uh, we will say our true goodbyes off the air, so it's just us between friends. That's right. Everybody else gets the they they, they get the public stuff in private. We get all sexy. Yeah. We're gonna, yeah. It is truly after dark now. <laughs> That's right. We've got some things to discuss. Go watch the hunt if you listen to this whole fucking thing and you haven't seen it. Go watch the hunt if you've watched it but it haven't watched it recently. Put the duct tape on the windows. Duck and cover. Watch out for those windmills. I hear they kill all the birds. Uh, I don't even know. Biff has the almanac. Biff still has the fucking almanac. Save us. <laughs> it's your kids. <laughs>
This is Bo from legionpodcasts.com. Hey, it's been a crazy time, and when the world gets nuts, we're happy to offer some old-fashioned podcast entertainment. But for some folks, getting a laugh out of a show isn't really helping these days. People who depend on tips in their bartending jobs or have been put on furlough with no pay till the worst of this coronavirus threat has passed. That's a tough spot. That's why we set up a GoFundMe for members of our community, a sort of grand scale, take a penny, leave a penny. For people like myself, for whom the recent disruptions haven't kicked us out of work, well, we can drop a few of those extra pennies in the GoFundMe jar. For those who are directly affected by recent events and find themselves looking for money to pay the electric bill or keep the water on, well, how about you give me a shout at bo, B-O, at legionpodcasts.com. Let me know the situation and what you need, and we'll do our best to make life a little easier. And you can find links to the GoFundMe on the front page of legionpodcasts.com, on our Facebook group page, or on Twitter at Legion Podcasts, where it's the pinned tweet. For those of you who are able, thanks in advance for chipping in. And members of our community who need a hand, hey, here we are. Remember, stay safe, stay healthy, and we're all going to get through this together. Legion isn't just a name, it's who we are. Thanks for listening to all the shows here on Legion Podcasts, and we'll talk to you soon. I I have to kill.